Uh, there's been a slight schedule change. We're going to have uh, Christina Elizondo give her talk first, and then afterwards we'll have uh, Mrs. Uh, Mary Reyes come over here and give her talk. So we're just switching the middle talks real quick. And also, uh, Mrs. Robles Horry, raise your hand. She's the one who uh, brought us some donuts this morning. She came all the way from the valley. She had to deal with flooding, um, tornadoes. She was talking about the whole thing, and then she got here on time. Wow. wow. And then uh, Valerie Taylor, not here? Okay, she's the one who brought us the, uh, the tacos this morning. So thank you, Valerie. If you're in the baseball line, I don't know where you're at. Okay, so uh, our next speaker is uh, Christina Elizondo. She is a uh, VA dietitian. She's going to be speaking on nutrition and dietary requirements for the diabetic elders. So uh, please welcome her. far as from a dietary standpoint. Growing up Mexican-American my childhood, I grew up with a very, very poor diet. We're talking about just a bunch of carbs and protein. I remember my mother had about 12 different cereal boxes on the refrigerator, gallons of whole milk. You know, just not offered lots of fruits and vegetables. And so now as a dietitian, I think in retrospect how poor my diet was. And as a healthcare professional, being Mexican-American, how much I can try and connect um, with American Mexican American population here at the VA because of both and with the San, San Antonio community for that matter. And I'll give you an example to you. I went um, a few months ago. I went to go get my hair cut, and my friend had told me, "Why don't you go to this place? It's really inexpensive, but it was out in the South Side." I was like, "Okay, I'll give it a try." You know, there's nothing wrong with getting a really good deal on a haircut. Well, I was there, and there was a bunch of beauticians, um, hairstylists. A lot of them were overweight and Mexican. And so, you know, when you get there, you get your hair cut for the first time, you have somebody talk to you about, so what do you do for a living? And then so I went into my profession, I'm a dietitian. Oh, really, what do you, what do you talk about? And I said, well, I really just focus on weight management, you know, really um, honing in on your diet and, and disease prevention, heart disease and diabetes. Well, by the end of my haircut, I had a whole entourage around me <laughs> wanting to know more and more information about dieting and preventative medicine. And so I just thought to myself, I said, how much of a need and a demand is it? How crucial it is in today's society, in the San Antonio community, how we can play much of a role in changing people's lives. So I was you know, just giving free advice, but I, I realized that's just a, just a passion because there's such a demand here for that. So we're going to just really talk about that in that perspective. So in today's discussion, I'm going to talk to you about the diabetes in the US and some information. <coughs> Background information of the characteristics of the American Amer Mexican American diet, acculturation and the diet, <clears throat> the uh, current diabetic American diabetic guidelines for nutrition management, and then our nutrition education approach to the diabetic um, diet here at the VA, and then also just introducing the term of mindful eating. So diabetes in the United States. According to the Inter International Diabetes Federation, approximately 382 million people worldwide and 24.4 million Americans have diabetes. So more than 25% of the U.S. population aged 65 years and older have diabetes mellitus. 7 million of individuals with diabetes are unaware that they have this condition and 1.9 million new individuals are diagnosed each year. So again, it's just much of a demand and much of a need to uh, be that healthcare professional and just talking about um, preventative medicine in terms of nutrition. So some challenges of working with some of the Mexican Americans is um, it's, re it's important to remember that their particular group includes distinct cultures, customs, and again, most importantly, the diets depending on their uh, areas of familial origin. <coughs> Not all Latinos identify the same cultural construct or customs, so it's important to deal with patients on an individual and individual family basis. So take a look at here at these examples of the dishes. What do you see typically? What stands out? Fat, 
salt, carbs. This is the bulk of the Mexican American diet, right? Not a whole lot of color. We're talking about browns and whites. Maybe just a little sprinkle of lettuce and tomatoes, you know, on some of those enchilada dishes. You see some guacamole, but a lot of high fatty, high calorie, high carbohydrate meals. Um, and so again, and, and you notice this too. Family gatherings, you know, culturally speaking. I don't know how many phone calls I got during the Spurs game. Hey, why don't you come on over? We're barbecuing, you know, bring some beverages. Let's just hang out. And you know, it's a buffet style during the week for the Spurs game. I mean, we're talking about every type of family event is surrounded by food. So if we are aware of that, or we talk about patients and just being cognizant of the uh, family dynamics or the traditional foods that are brought about, you know, just making those changes. But I, I often struggle you know, being a dietitian and being Mexican American, dealing with my own family challenges. You know, oh, here's the food police. You know, let's you know take the food away. You know, here she comes. <laughs> or I have my family member roll her eyes every time I modify my uh, dish at a restaurant. Can't you just normal, nor, um, order like a normal person? So again, it's just I have those challenges. But again, I you know I'm here trying to lead by example. So I'll, I'll take the verbal abuse. That's fine. <laughs> So here's another um, visual. Uh, so this is typically what happens during the holidays, Thanksgiving, all the way throughout uh, Christmas. Does this, this look familiar? Okay. So the, obviously, what what are they making? The molids, right? So you can see. I mean, it's a huge family event during the holidays. You have uh, some of the family members soaking the husk. You have the grandma there on the left hand corner rolling up with the molids. And then you have the other people making the masa, right? So it's a it's a stationary event, and it's it's a very custom, and you know it's just a way of bonding and bringing the family together, especially during the holidays. So, um, but the problem is, or the, what we can do is just offering other ways to make those changes and keeping those traditional foods, but realizing that these foods are a part of their lives, but we can just make those modifications, that way they can keep the tradition, but just cutting out those extra calories and, and just focusing on weight management, helping prevent um, type 2 diabetes. So that's what our goal is. So some of the characteristics of the Mexican-American diet, some of the core elements of the traditional diet include, again, we rely on grains and beans, incorporating fresh fruits and red vegetables, eating more beef other than any other protein out there, um, you're talking about Baba going Big Red Sunday mornings. You know, they sell at HEB Marketplace as a package deal now. It's all wrapped up in a clear plastic. So it, it goes hand in hand, making it very easy for the consumer to purchase. Um, eating more eggs and drinking more whole milk. And then uh, compared to non-Hispanic whites, diet is usually, uh, again, lower in fat, sugar, and candy. So acculturation and the Mexican-American diet. The Mexican... American culture deteriorates the traditional top diet. This is what the problem is. Lifestyle characteristics of second generation Hispanics. Again, we have a sedentary lifestyle. We don't want to move anymore. We're indoors either with advanced technology, on the computer, even kids playing video games. It's too hot out outside. You know, people think they're going to melt or just pass out if they're outside for long periods of time, so they'd rather stay indoors with the San Antonio heat, and that's a huge problem. Increased intake of processed foods such as fast foods, hot dogs, and lunch meats. And increased fat intake and then increased sugar intake from candies and sodas. And that's a huge problem is the candies and sodas. Barbara even talked about you know, how there's kids out there that are using uh, those bottles filled with juice, but then even them that they're using regular sodas and they're just constantly you know, sucking it you know, in their mouths throughout the day. And what's that? Why it's problematic is that we are um, introducing those unhealthy eating habits to these kids at such a young age, and as a result of that, it's hard for people to make those changes because they crave those sweet, they crave those high fat, those high salty meals. <coughs> so, as a result of all this, this is the obesity <laughs> epidemic. Because we are talking about the Mexican American culture, I threw this living la vida longa. This is a, a spin-off with uh, Ricky Martin's Live in La Vida Loca. Do, do you all know the song? Okay, so for those of you that know, don't know what longa is, it's a, a Spanish term. It's a term of endearment, meaning tires or rolls. 
Um, muffin tops for those women up there. Not to, not to offend anybody, but it's just that extra fat that's hanging over your, um, you know, in, in, in that abdominal region. What, what's funny to me, though, is that we see this out and about. You know, I'm pretty observant now. I go out there, you know, to HEB or just out and about in the community, and I realize how many, how much people are overweight. But the problem is in the San Antonio community, it's become a, we normalize being overweight. And so when you're average, or even on the thin side, you are way too skinny, you're unhealthy. You know, it's just like we, we have um, promoted eating more or, or being thick or overweight is considered somewhat healthy, which in turn, it's really not. So some of the barriers to achieve glucose control is individuals more likely to rely on family and friends for advice. They lack family support. So family eating, you know, drinking the individuals what was told to avoid, they continue to drink that. <clears throat> also, I just wanted to say individuals more likely to rely on family or friends for advice. You know, we've heard of the term nopalas or cactus. They eat a lot of those or there's a cactus pill that they can take to help manage their blood sugars. Or if they saturate their coffee and cinnamon, it's going to help cure their diabetes. So little things like that that just hear from other family members. And so they kind of just go to town with that. Um, lack of transportation to healthcare facilities, so they're really unable to make their medical appointments. That's a big issue. Uh, placing family before, before their own personal needs. I see this too from a cultural standpoint. You have your significant other, you know, who's diabetic, but the other person, husband or wife, is non-diabetic. They have no desire to make changes in their eating habits. So it's really hard for that diabetic individual to be on board in making those changes because of big barriers that the significant other doesn't have a desire to make that change. So looking at it as a team effort, it's really hard to overcome that when the other person is not on board in making those changes. Uh, and then experience language difference with healthcare workers. So for example, if you're not Spanish speaking on the the uh, patient is fluent in Spanish, secondary language is English, it's really hard to connect with that patient if you're not fluent in Spanish. You can't really deliver that message if you can't speak their language. They're really more, you know, I have some patients who hide their food and they don't want to tell me what they eat, you know, um, but if you have somebody who's Spanish speaking, you know, and can relate to them, they have more than likely they'll divulge a little bit more information than they want to tell you. They feel more comfortable in that regard. Okay, so the updated guidelines for nutrition therapy recommendations to manage diabetes is um, it's nutrition therapy again is recommended for all people for type one and type two diabetics, and it's an effective component of the overall treatment plan to regulate their blood sugars. There's not a one size fits all eating pattern for diabetic individuals, so the goal is again to improve glucose, blood pressure, and cholesterol levels, and this is all associated with being overweight. So with healthy weight loss, they see improvement in not only their blood sugars, their cholesterol levels, their blood pressure, if you have sleep apnea, a better sleeping pattern. So it just goes hand in hand. And again, the culprit is being overweight. And this is really important to get those individualized um, nutrition therapy plans. Ideally, you want to get it by a registered dietitian. Recommendations that each person with diabetes be actively engaged in self-management education. So we want to empower them. We want them to be able to manage their diabetes on their own. So we want to provide them with those resources and their skills. And this is, again, this is a treatment planning um, that goes hand in hand with your health care provider. For overweight and obese adults with type 2 diabetes, at risk for diabetes, reducing energy intake is the key. So we want to balance that energy or reduce calories not specifically a certain macronutrient, but cutting back on calories and promoting healthy weight loss is the key. Uh, modest weight loss may provide clinical benefits. So again, improved glycemia, blood pressure, and <coughs> lipids. And again, this is um, essential for those that are diagnosed in the early disease process. So if they're pre-diabetic and they're overweight, that's when it's really important to talk to them at that standpoint, taking the time to talk about lifestyle changes. Not a diet, but long-term lifestyle changes, setting realistic goals with that patient. And that way we can prevent them from developing type 2 diabetes. This is when it's most important. 
So specific recommendations for modest weight loss is we want intensive lifestyle interventions, uh, nutritional therapy, counseling, physical activity, and behavior change. And what's also crucial is they need just constant ongoing support because they can easily fall off that wagon. If we give them those recommendations, they're ready to come on board, but they don't have that family support that they need, they can just easily go back to those unhealthy eating habits or sedentary lifestyle. So again, doing follow-up visits and making sure that they have the family support that they need is, is crucial. There's no ideal percentage of calories from carbs, protein, or fat. Macronutrient distribution is based on individualized assessments. So again, current eating patterns, a patient's preferences, and then meeting those metabolic goals. So pretty much the nutrition summary guidelines here is there's no st a standard meal plan or eating pattern that works universally for all persons with diabetes. So again, nutritional therapy should be individualized based on the following. Your health goals, personal and cultural preferences, so this is really important with uh, you know, being Mexican American is, is uh, meeting that individual halfway with those cultural preferences. Healthy literacy, so making it simplistic for people that have difficulty with literacy skills. Access to helpful choices, so being realistic if, you know, if they're on a budget, so making a certain meal plan that's specific to meet those needs or their demands. And then again, the readiness and willingness and ability to change. Um, is crucial as well. You can give the patient all the resources and all the recommendations that you want, but if they're not ready to make that change, it's really not going to go anywhere. And you have to, but, but be patient, don't give up on that, on that individual. So nutrition in intervention should include the following. Emphasis on variety of minimal processed, nutrient-dense foods and appropriate portion sizes as part, part of the helpful eating pattern. Provide persons with diabetes uh, with tools for day-to-day -day food plan and behavior change that can be maintained long-term. So our focus on when we teach class here for diabetic diet education, again, we focus on weight reduction, increased physical activity level, promoting balance, meal planning, limiting carbs, um, fat intake, specifically the bad fat, saturated trans fats, and then um, sodium. So establish energy balance through weight reduction, specifically encouraging a modest weight loss of 5 to 10 percent. This can make a huge impact on improving their blood sugar and, and uh, hemoglobin in sea levels. And then also encouraging a decrease in calories from carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, as I already mentioned to you. With specific in, specifically increasing physical activity, so healthful eating plan along with physical activity goes hand in hand. You can't really have one without the other in order, in, in order for you not to see the results that you want. And it's got to be sustainable and it has to be consistent. So promoting weight loss, long-term weight, weight maintenance plan, as I mentioned. This again improves insulin sensitivity, glucose, blood pressure, and lipids. And then specifically, uh, the physical guideline recommendations is to exercise 150 minutes of moderate intense aerobic activity per week. So this is about 30 minutes a day for five times a week. I tell my patients, if you have time to watch TV, you have time to move. So I don't want to hear it. Resistance training also three times per week goes hand in hand with aerobic physical activity. Statistics shows that if you do uh, resistance training along with with um, aerobic activity, you'll see good, sustainable, uh, healthy weight loss, more so than just doing one or the other, but those go hand in hand as well. Promoting balanced meal plan, again, eating variety of foods each day, making sure the plate is nice and colorful, not just browns and whites, but incorporating what's called those non-starchy vegetables is what we promote. Eating those three meals a day, not skipping a meal, because that's gonna slow down our metabolism when we have a tendency to overeat. Um, so that's really important, a lot of people have a Commonly, we'll skip breakfast and then they'll have a decent lunch and then a heavy dinner and then we'll go to bed. So we want to learn how to distribute those calories and then eating ideally no more than 45 hours of carb is what we recommend as well. Knowing what foods contain carbohydrates and then eating those timely meals throughout the day, a calorie distribution throughout the day, not just all carbs one meal and then no carbs another meal. <coughs> and then limiting your sugar and sweet intake. Barbara had given you a demonstration of the sodas out there. You'd be surprised how many People drink regular sodas, sweet tea, sugary beverages. I just tell them it's pretty much liquid candy. If you can make that one change, switching from sugary beverages to sugar-free, or your primary source of hydration should be water, they make that one change, they, they can lose significant amount of weight gain. And I've seen, I mean, weight loss, and I've seen those results. And they're very pleased. They're like, wow, oh, I didn't realize 
how much soda I was drinking or how many calories it had or how much of an impact it was making on my blood sugar levels. So it's a good eye opener for that patient. Um, limiting, I'm sorry, reducing your intake of high fatty foods. So again, high calorie, high fatty foods, helping improve those cholesterol levels. And then limiting alcohol intake. Again, I also mentioned it's empty calories. Um, not binge drinking too is recommended. You know, we have some guidelines for, al uh, for drinking alcohol. For women, ideally you want to drink one drink a day. For men, it's two drinks a day. We're talking about 12 ounce can of beer, five ounces of wine, and then uh, one and a half ounce of uh, distilled spirits, you know, vodka or hard liquor. And patients say, well, what if I don't drink during the day? Can I mean, during the week, can I just drink at, on the weekends and save that, you know, the amount of drinks at, at that time? I'm like, no, this isn't rollover minutes. You can't binge drink <laughs> in, in your week, in your weekends. It's got to be distributed. Moderation is the key. So it's funny because a lot of patients have this black or white mentality. It's all or nothing. It's hard to find a happy medium with them. So that's challenging. So limit carbohydrate foods. So again, I tell my patients it's broken down into four different food categories. You have your starches, fruits, milks, and your sweets. And then again, just focusing and getting patients to decrease the amount of food that they eat, not to eliminate it entirely. Food is pleasure. I'm not going to take your food away from you. What we can work hand in hand, you know, meet me halfway. What are some good realistic goals that I can help you with? I can help you achieve. You know, and I'll, I'll talk about that in detail here in a second. So some of the carbohydrates that we recommend per day, or this is the recommendations for carbohydrates that we recommend to our patients for both men and women. For men, it's three to four carbs per serving, which is equivalent to 45 to 60 grams per meal. So for those that don't know, I'm just going to throw it out there. One carbohydrate serving is equivalent to 15 grams of carbs, so that's where we get the 45 to 60 grams. For women, it's about two to three carb servings per meal, which is equivalent to 30 to 45 grams. So what, uh, during the class, we focused on for both men and women, 45 grams of carbs per meal. I also mentioned to you that a good teaching point is, it's just really teaching you portion control. It's not what you can and cannot have, it's how much. But this is how the general population should be eating. Michelle Obama came out with the mypyramid.gov. We did away with the, the food guide pyramid, right? We came out with this myplate.gov. If you go to the website, myplate.gov. That's how everybody should be eating. This is what we've been giving to our diabetic patients weight management patients for years, the quarter plate method. So again, this is going to benefit the entire family. That's all it's teaching is portion control. You spend an obscene amount of money on these, you know, supplements, glucerner, diet, you know, everything's a marketing ploy. Where if you can just cut back, that's really all you need to do. Limiting salt or sodium, that can play a role again in blood pressure. Recommendations are consuming sodium of 2,300 milligrams or less per day, which is about seven to 800 milligrams of salt per meal. Can I say something? Yes. You know, um, a, a couple of years ago, I was really feeling kind of bloated, and and, and I realized I was eating those um, pumpkin seeds, mm -hmm. which are dipped in salt. Mm -hmm. And it was going, and I didn't realize how much salt was there. Yes. But it, but when I looked at the whole picture, it was just, it was too much. I was well over the 2,300 milligrams. Right. So just being kind of conscientious, I mean, people don't really look at the food label. Were you looking at the serving size, servings per container? You know, there's a misconception out there that people think that the nutritional content is based on the entire package, where it's actually just a serving size, but there's a so many servings per container in that particular package, so we're overeating what that nutritional content is. So it's easy to, you know, overeating carbs, calories, salt. So, you know, for example, like chips, a handful of chips is one ounce, but the servings per container is about, I don't know, five or six. People have a tendency to just eat straight from the bag. So not being aware of the amount of calories that they're putting in with just that one particular product. Okay, so major focus on nutrition education for Mexican Americans. So I've already mentioned some of these points here, but I'll go ahead and reinforce that. You want to advocate both preservation and change in the diet. So let your patient know that you're the provider. You're, again, you're not going to take their food away. You're not going to take their bundles away. You're not going to take away their product of deals. You know, just again, finding, um, setting some realistic goals with the patient. Point out some healthy aspects of their diet and incorporate them in, into the recommended diet. 
advocate family support. So I can't stress this enough. Strong family support is associated with good diet and exercise habits among individuals with diabetes. And so again, they're more likely to stay consistent if the whole family is involved as a team and everyone's on board and making those healthy, healthy changes. I tell you, I'm, I'm a little frowned upon with my own family member being a dietitian. I make changes, I bring home, you know, bring a healthy dish, and oh, here we go, you know, why can't we just eat and have a good time, you know? So, you know, it's, it's challenging. So major focus of nutrition education for Hispanics suggests small, simple changes. So small, simple changes can go a long way. Offer the patient a choice of healthy changes they can make and allow them to choose uh, which ones that they want to draw, try. And again, be supportive. They need that constant su support system, that reinforcement. You're doing a great job. Just little positive reinforcements can go a long way. Praising them for their weight loss effort. Praising them for making that small change. That'll want to want, to want them to continue that, uh, making those helpful changes. So again, many uh, clients find comfort and sense of identity, which what they consider traditional Hispanic foods. Sometimes it takes uh, time for clients to want to make that change, so be patient. I see patients for the same reason, four or five times, four sessions, you know, and finally they set one goal, and they've accomplished that one goal. Oh, you know, oh, I'm so proud of you, and you know, they're just smiling and happy. If they've seen they've had a little bit of weight loss, you know, they're really happy with those little results. So again, small changes can go a long way for that patient, and be patient with that patient. So specific recommendations to suggest. So I already mentioned to you, eating plenty of vegetables. Not the peas, the corn, the potatoes, right. the beans. We're talking about your veggie vegetables. That's how my patients think like a rabbit. You can go to town with eating lettuce, tomatoes, cauliflower, cucumbers. I mean, and that goes for the general population. We're lacking those non-starchy vegetables. What's nice about these are very long calories. They're high in dietary fiber, so that's going to help with your satiety levels, where you don't have a tendency to overeat. And they're very, very low in carbohydrates, and they're nutrient-dense energy types of foods. So again, just promoting those healthy um, vegetables. It adds a lot of bulk to your diet without adding those extra calories. So that's really important, and those extra carbs. So some of the recommendations, um, oh, well, I'm sorry, eating plenty of vegetables, whole fruits, whole grain foods versus the processed products. So again, the high in salt, um, less nutrient value than the whole grain types of products out there. So ways to extend some like eggs, you know, I'm just having three eggs every morning, but maybe just cutting back on that, but increasing the volume with adding some of the gallo or onions, bell peppers, tomatoes, expanding the amount of food that you eat without those extra calories. Suggesting using a corn tortilla or a wheat tortilla instead of a flour tortilla if they have a hard time switching over. Well, instead of eating three, then just try one and a half, you know, instead of having a three chorizo egg and tacos every morning, <coughs> cut it back down to one and a half. Include fish in your meals two to three times a week. Eat more food and water. Replace fish for beef when making tacos. Choose lean cuts of beef and pork to reduce the cost of buying lean beef products. Cutting the fat off the meat. So a good lean cuts of beef or sirloin chuck, round. You want to, you see the fat, you know, trim it off and throw it away. You don't eat the fat. That's what I tell my patients. I have a hard time with that. Um, so cutting the fat to the meat prior to cooking or eating ground beef is a good idea. Removing the skin from the chicken and turkey before eating it. They really like fried chicken. Okay, well, maybe just have one piece of fried chicken and take the skin off the other piece. You know, just again, small changes can go a long way. Setting some realistic goals with that patient. Choosing lower fat dairy products. So encourage patients to decrease from whole milk to 2% milk. If you tell your patients to go from whole milk to skim milk, they're going to look at you and roll your eyes at you. There's no way you can drink that, they're going to tell you. It's like water. But if you train your body, if you taper down from whole milk to 2% milk, from 2% to 1% milk, and then then some, it's easy to make that transition. I grew up as a child drinking large quantities of whole milk. I drank whole milk like water. Now I can't even touch whole milk. So again, it's just a process. If they don't want to use low-fat cheese, I suggest using shredded cheese or use less of that brick cheese. Choose water and calorie-free products. Again, we already talked about that. I suggest using a sugar substitute in their coffee or tea. They think they're going to get cancer if they use sweet and lower equal. It's like, okay, but your hemoglobin A1C is 14. I don't, I don't see the picture here. Add water to your fruit juice or decrease your sugar intake. And then again, drink sugar <coughs> water, which is like crystal water. If they have a hard time, just drinking good old-fashioned water. Cook with less fat. Suggest using cooking sprays like pan cooking spray to fry around with. 
Use cooking oils for cooking instead of solid fats like shortening, manteca, bacon fat. No more than one tablespoon for a large pan. Using ham or smaller amounts of salted pork in cooked beans. Refried beans using water or one small amount of um, oil, less than one teaspoon. So again, reinforcing the watch portion sizes, focusing on getting patients just to cut back on half or by one. When I teach the class, they don't really like what I'm saying because I can see their facial expressions like they <laughs> want to choke me. What are we supposed to eat? This is nothing. I said, okay, well, just a, a good short-term goal. Whatever you're used to eating, just cut it in half. So you see those frowns turn upside down. It's like, okay, I can do that. I can work with that. So again, four tacos at breakfast suggest them to eat two. If they decline, then negotiate. Compromise by eating three. <laughs> Whatever works. Whatever you can do to get them to cut that. So, um, so in addition to adjusting what you eat to manage your diabetes, it's really important. It can be equally helpful on changing on how you eat. So we're going to just talk about a little bit of mindful eating as a a new terminology, not you know, not fairly new, but it comes hand in hand with diabetes management. So I just wanted to focus on some key take home points. Uh, certain mindless eating habits, such as eating rapidly without really savoring that food. So even as an individual, you can be aware of this as well. Um, eating while you're doing other activities, eating while you're watching TV. You know, everyone's snacking at the kitchen, just talking and just eating. Not that you're really hungry, it's just more of a socialization. You know, and again, that's very uh, cultural for us as being Mexican Americans. Um, so this might <coughs> influence not only what you eat, but also how much you eat, and it's most likely causing you to eat more than what you wanted or ever intended to eat. So again, mindful eating on the other hand, so those were points of mindless eating. Mindful eating on the other hand can help you gain control over what and how much and even why you eat. Do you eat because it tastes good? Just because it tastes, are you using food as a coping mechanism? So what are some barriers that we can work with? Why are you eating just to eat? Eating with attention and awareness, listening to those hunger signals. People just eat again because it tastes good. Are you truly hungry? Do you stop eating when you're satisfied? Or do you eat when you're stuck and you have to undo your belt buckle? That's an indication that you're eating way too much food. Increase your awareness of current eating patterns. Identify habits that you can change. And small changes in the way you can prepare, serve, and consume your meals. In conclusion, understanding, again, the Mexican-American diet culture, including how food and family ties into this role, it's important as practitioners and healthcare professionals to know in order to help our patients make those necessary changes into obtaining glycemic control for overall improvement all of their life. Thank you all for your time and attention. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to make a comment. It's interesting because, you know, a lot of the things that you talked about that's focused, I know that we're in the Hispanic capital of the world, and but a lot of things that are specific for, for that particular culture, it applies to everybody. You know, and that's a very good point. You're absolutely right. Everybody has this. Uh, traditional foods, you know, whether what's whatever ethnicity you are. And so culture again, is so important. Yes, it is. You know, if you're going to really get at the crux of the, the issues, you've got to understand <coughs> what culture you're dealing with, whether it's African American, black folks, or whether it's dealing with folks from the Midwest. Absolutely. You know, because mm -hmm. they're they're probably more of a problem than some people because a lot of them don't even eat any vegetables, you know, meat and potatoes, right. yeah. you know, which is very unhealthy. And we all have to eat to survive. So again, it's just a matter of what works for each individual and setting some good realistic health goals for that patient.